love lives here. So I have the honor to uh, introduce our guest speaker today. He is uh, Peter Bedard. Bedard. Did I say it right? Bedard. He has a master's in consciousness studies. And uh, he is also a uh, certified hypnotherapist. He has extensive training in spirituality as well as alternative health and has helped um, thousands of people overcome anxiety. He has a thriving private practice and does give uh, keynote talks um, and also workshops around the world. Um, he is also a licensed spiritual practitioner and a member of the Center for Spiritual Living Palm Springs. He has two books. Uh, they include uh, Billy and the Anxiety Monster. We're going to hear more about that today. I can't wait. And also Convergence Healing, Healing Pain with Energetic Love. So I invite us all to give uh, Peter a really warm Riverside welcome. Are we on? There we go. <sighs> Good morning. Uh, let's just take a moment to breathe. It's always my experience that when we breathe, we, we are experiencing the oneness of the divine. So in those moments where I feel hijacked or separated, where I feel alone, I remind myself that science tells us we live in a world that's all connected, that's all one. And science is connecting to spirituality, which has said for thousands of years that we are all one. And so to feel that, to remember that, to know that oneness, I just remind myself to breathe. Pretty good, huh? So let's do it again. <sighs> to consciously breathe in the goodness that is the divine that is welcome to us at any moment everywhere, right? Mm. All right, this mic keeps dropping down, so let's see if I can get this too. Can you hear me? You got it? You're all good? All right, we're going to hold it there. <laughs> so I wanted to talk about loving ourselves so much, even when life is rough, even when there's chaos in the world, even when there might be personal issues that you're going through, even when you may be feeling physical pain. To love ourselves so much is the start. It is the end of all healing. Do you get that? It is the start. It is the end of all healing. Sometimes we get hijacked by all these things. We turn on the news, right? We turn on the news and we get hijacked by fear. We get hijacked by worry. We get hijacked by all these things that are happening in the world. And the world looks like a dangerous and scary place. And yet... In actuality, we are living in a safer world than we ever have been. Isn't that interesting? And that is done by empirical study. The world was a much more violent place even a hundred years ago. And yet we are so focused on our safety. We are so focused on our fears. We just know about them now. <laughs> we have that wonderful thing called the internet that lets you know about it every day, every moment. And that wonderful thing called your cell phone, which lets, which lets you know about all the pain and suffering in the world. And we get hijacked by these devices. We get hijacked by these corporations that are putting out news and feeding it to you 24-7 so that you feel addicted to it. And when you're addicted to it, you want more of it. How many of you ever been that place, in that place? I have, man. I got watching the news a while ago, and I could not stop. And boy, did I get depressed. And I had to come back to God. I had to come back and say, mm -mm, I'm not letting that human fear separate me from my divine. I'm not letting that happen anymore. I'm conscientious. I pay attention. 
I'm not sticking my hole in the sand, my head in the sand in a hole. That's where it went. <laughs> I'm in awareness without being hijacked. And so I'm challenging you to do that. When things look dark, when things look sad, when things look desperate, when you feel lonely, lean into your faith, lean into the truth, whether it's an empirical scientific truth that tells you we are living in a moment, a period that is safer than it ever has been. Or it tells you something else. You know, <laughs> when I was a kid, I was a latchkey kid. And my my father worked. My mother was a housewife, but I was the last kid, and you know what that's like. <laughs> Everybody was off doing their things, and there was a big gap between me and my siblings. So I was on my own a lot. I just had to come home by a certain time. When the sun went down in the summer, I had to be home. Outside of that, they didn't have a clue where I was. <laughs> Statistically, we look back at that time when I was a kid in the 70s. In the 70s, there were double digits child molestation. There were double digits kidnappings, you know, children being kidnapped by the white van down the corner. There was all kinds of stuff happening. <laughs> and in that experience, we still survived. In that experience, you look at the statistics nowadays, and they're in the low single digits. And yet we, we hover over our children. We hover over our communities. We demand we need more police when there's actually less violence now than there was 40 years ago. We get hijacked. Can you see that in your behavior? Can you see it in our communities? Can you see it in our culture? One of my best friends growing up was an Armenian girl, and she was taught by her community to hate another group of people for a genocide that happened a hundred and something years ago. And yes, that was wrong. Yes, that was bad. Yes, there needs to be retribution in some way, some sort of recognition. Absolutely, it needs to happen. And yet, Teaching her children to hate is not part of the solution of healing, is it? And so who gets to decide when we heal? Look at the wars in the world right now. There's just war after war, one side hating the other side, and that war is never going to stop until one person on one of those sides decides to choose love decides to let go of the past, let go of the pain, let go of the fear, let go of the judgment. Now, that's a macro level, isn't it? On the micro level, somebody killed me. Back when I was a kid, I was almost 18 years old, and a man drove me into the back of a semi-truck. I slammed into that semi-truck while I was on my moped, and I died. I had one of those near-death experiences. Crossed over, came back. Obviously, I'm still here. <laughs> Thank you. Now, I could, and I would be encouraged by people to live in that anger. I'd be encouraged by people to have hate. I'd be told I was righteous in my hate. I lost my career at that time. I was a prodigy. I was discovered to be a dancer. Just like there were football player bodies and basketball player bodies, I had a ballerina body. <laughs> I was flexible, flexible. I could jump really high. I was discovered, quote unquote, put into school. And within a year of my training, I was teaching other students. That was taken away from me. I could be angry. I could be resentful. And maybe you're even thinking now, well, yeah, you should be. But I'm trying to say, no, I shouldn't be. Because that pain hurts me. Being hijacked by that person's thing that they did to me all those many years ago has left my body 
in pain, even to this day, my 40th year anniversary of my death, <laughs> as funny as that sounds, is this October. My spine was cracked. I shattered my left knee. I split my wrist open. I lost all the nerves in my hand. I had undiagnosed brain damage. It's why I mix up words sometimes like I did earlier. <laughs> and yet, I forgave. And so I want to do a little exercise with you. I want you to find something that maybe you've been holding on to. Maybe there's an anger, a pain, a frustration, something that happened when you were a kid or something that just happened last week or something that you watched the news and really pissed you off. <laughs> I want you to find whatever that thing is that you're still holding in your heart. I want you to close your eyes if you're willing to. And forgiveness is freedom, freedom for yourself. And so I'm inviting you to rise above your human self because that human self wants to hold on to that pain. We even identify by it. We create identities built in that pain. I'm inviting you to rise above that humanness Rise into your highest self, rise into your potential, rise into your divine source. And from your highest self to the highest self of whoever did you wrong, I'm inviting you to say, thank you. And we say thank you because when we can move into gratitude, we can truly let go. Thank you. I say thank you to the man who murdered me because he brought me here to this moment. I would not be here if that had not happened. I would not have become a therapist. I would not have spent the last 19 years traveling around the world, writing books, doing different things. I am grateful for that experience because it made me the human being I am today. And so I rise up. I rise above and from my highest self to his highest self. I say thank you. And whatever pain he might have been feeling to take that, his anger, his suffering out on me, I say I love you because I choose to love even the most heinous thing that was done. I choose to love because by loving and sending that love out to him into the world, I can love myself. And so from my highest self to his highest self, I say, I love you. From my highest self to his highest self, I'm inviting you to rise up and say, I'm so sorry for your suffering. And from my highest self to your highest self, I'm inviting you to continue in gratitude to say, I love you. Thank you. I'm sorry. And forgive me. And just notice what happens when from your heart you speak these words in divine alignment knowing that love is truly all there is. Take a deep breath and with me sigh it out and let it go. <sighs> That's right. Thank you for closing your eyes. Thank you for opening them. <laughs> and so we get hijacked. We get hijacked by our opinions. We get hijacked by our pain. We get hijacked by our judgments. We get hijacked by our anxieties and fears. And so I'm inviting you again to see those things in your, excuse me, in your life, to step back. If you're feeling anxious in your heart right now because you just watched the news or listened to it on the way in or whatever you were doing, whatever was happening, I want you to say to that anxiety, I see you. I wrote a book and called anxiety a monster because in that understanding, if we're living with anxiety, it can feel like a monster sometimes. It feels like something that comes on and attacks us. And in my 19 plus years as a therapist, I have come across this experience a lot with my clients where they feel like their pain or their anxiety or whatever it is is controlling them. Who's had that feeling before? Right. Right. And to recognize that it is a part of you. It is a, a small part of you. 
that we often make into this big thing that controls our lives, but it is a small part of you. And that part is suffering. And so what that part needs more than anything is to be loved. So I'm inviting you to go to whatever part of your body, maybe having a a little stiffness. <laughs> I'm inviting you to go to any part of your body that may be suffering in any way. And instead of beating it up and making it wrong and making it bad, when I was a kid, all the girls used to talk about their thunder thighs and how they hated their thunder thighs. It's a good phrase. It's not really around anymore. But they would talk about that, and they'd beat up their bodies. You don't heal by beating up. You heal by loving. You got that? And so I'm inviting you to go to any part of you physically that may, have be, may be suffering right now and to love it. And so one of the things I've learned over the years is that my clients have taught me, specifically my, my cancer clients, they taught me that we have to love these parts of us that are suffering. They taught me, and I was incredulous when they first taught me this, they taught me that they had to love their tumors wow, love the thing that is killing them. And I got it because I had to love the man who killed me. So I wonder if my clients could love their tumors. Instead of beating it up, love it. I wonder what you could do in your life. They taught me this, that these aren't things to think about in a way that you want to kill them or destroy them or you want to fight back, you want to beat them up, you want to make them wrong, you're ashamed, you're embarrassed of them, you want to cut them out and throw it away. It is a part of you, and it's a part of you that needs to be loved. I don't care if it's anxiety or if it's stress or if it's fear or a physical pain or a broken heart. It is a part of you that needs to be loved. So my question to you because we often get identified by these parts of us. My question to you is, are you willing to love? I see a couple head nods, but I don't see that many. For a community based in love, <laughs> I'm calling you out. For a community based in the understanding that God is, we are one. I want to see some more head nods. Are you willing to love these parts of you, of your story, of your life, of your body, of your mind, of your culture, of this world that we live in? Are you willing to love? There we go. <laughs> It was funny to kind of look around. You know, if you notice, I did that slow scan, and I'm like, hmm, what is going on here? I love myself so much. These are not words to take lightly. I love myself so much that I can let the man who killed me live a beautiful, loving, fulfilling life. I love myself so much that the people that colonized my brain... I can love them back. I love myself so much I can release the shackles that were holding my heart down. I love myself so much I can bring kindness to the parts of my body that are suffering. I love myself so much that I can accept true freedom for myself. Are you with me? Are you willing to say this with me? Are you willing to feel it in your bodies? Because just words, that, mm, that doesn't work. I want you to feel it. I want you to think it. I want you to know it. And so I'm going to have you repeat after me some things if you're willing to do it. And I need you to have more energy than I do. I need you to truly feel it, to shout it from the rooftops. I want you to work harder than me. 
This is what I tell my clients all the time. I, they come into me for a session. I'm like, yeah, let's go. We can do this, right? And I'm holding them, and I'm bringing them, and I'm bringing that energy to them, and I'm giving them all of that. And they're, you know, yeah, okay, well, I tried that. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Don't make me work harder than you. I should be sitting down and going, okay, go ahead. <laughs> all right? So I have a little affirmation, a few of them, that I want you to repeat with me. With all the energy, shouting it from the rooftops, filling this entire area with that truth. Are you ready? Then blow me away. There you go. I like that. I love myself so much. That I give those love, that I give love and permission to those who have wronged me. <laughs> that I release the judgment I have about myself. That I let my body heal and grow and expand. I love myself so much. That I forgive those who have wronged me. I love myself so much. I breathe with love and I let it go. There we are. Do you feel that shift, that energy that just happened in the room right now? I was waiting to get to that point. Can you really feel it? Because I can. You just touched my heart. I felt my heart open because I felt that honest, sincere connection. I felt you speak your truth. I felt that love. I hope you felt it too. I see a lot of heads nodding. That is where we need to go. That is how we need to walk. We need to walk free from the past. We need to walk free in our bodies. We need to walk free in our minds. We need to feel it. We need to know it. We need to be it right now. I've already had to do several experiential things. As you can tell, when I give my talks, when I do my book signings, when I do whatever it is, I don't just stand up here. I love connecting and interacting with you. And so from my highest self to your highest self, I say I love you. And I trust you feel that. From my highest self to your highest self. And so we're going to do one little exercise left. In order to create true change that is solid, that is understood, it must be felt first. It must be known. And we know things in our brains first. We know things through color and temperature and texture and sound and smell and taste and feeling. Do you get that? When I work with my addiction clients, I say to them, what's the color of, their, of your addiction? And they look at me with these faces like, what the hell are you talking about? And I say, truly, I want you to think about it. What is the color of your addiction? And they say, well, you know, whenever I, I black out or whenever I'm drinking and I don't want to, I see red. And I'm like, exactly. So you do know. You just never thought in that way. But your brain understands everything in your life through your senses, whether you're conscious of it or not. And so you could ask your body, well, what's the color of my pain? Give me a color. What's the color of your pain? Red? There you go. Now, you probably never thought of your pain in that way before. But I'm going to ask you, whenever you feel that pain and that red comes up in your consciousness, what is your color of joy? I want you to put that yellow right now in that red. What happens? No, truly, what happens? Great. Mm -hmm. I want you to flood your wrist. Your move. She's moving her wrist. I want you to flood your wrist with that yellow, beautiful, brilliant, golden sun, whatever it is, color. What happens to the red? Exactly. 
It dropped down, didn't it? Great. Do you see the power of the mind? We say we want change, but then we don't know how to change. So I am giving you a tool for everything in your life. I don't care if it's a physical pain. I don't care if it's a wound in your heart. I am giving you a tool right now. And I'm going to ask you to go journal about this. Write it down. I want you to go home or do something at some point, and I want you to look at some pain, and I want you to understand that pain through a color, a temperature, a texture, a sound, a smell, and a taste, and I want you to do what she did right there, and I want you to challenge that red and bring to it that beautiful yellow. And so right now, I want you to take this even further, because what we need to do is understand joy or love those are words that we call spiritual equivalents, and they're interchangeable with God. You understand that, right? Because I could say God, or I could say joy, and it's all the same thing. I could say love, I could say God, it's all the same thing. So I'm inviting you right now to understand joy. And I want you to think about it. I want you to give it a color. What is the color of your joy? What's the color of your joy? Pink. Pink like what? Pink like roses? Like what? What kind of flower? Be specific. Roses. So pink like a beautiful rose. And that rose has a texture to it. It has a smell to it. It even has a taste to it. If you ever even rose hips or had rose hip tea, it's delicious. It's a little spicy. <laughs> that rose is a little spicy. Maybe. So I want you to take a moment, and if you will, close your eyes again, and I want you to come to that place. Because it's one thing to go, oh, my pain is this, and I want to replace my pain. It's another thing to move into an even bigger area and say, I want to understand joy. So I'm inviting you right now to understand joy as a color, as a texture, as a temperature, as a sound, a vibration, or a frequency, as a smell, or a taste, or a feeling. And then I want you to understand that word. Maybe it is is yellow and then say it's yellow like what fill in the blank so when you go home and you take some time to change to grow to expand your life you're going to say oh my joy is and it is like this my joy is like blue, like the Mediterranean Sea and the desert sky. My joy is wide open. It's that beautiful blue that is translucent that you could see through in the ocean. You could see 30 feet down into the Mediterranean through a blue sea. It is that sky that is just like that ocean that you can see higher and higher. That is my joy. If that's your joy, share it with me. Take it. Use that. What is the color of your joy? What is the temperature of your joy? What is the sound, the vibration, the frequency? What is the taste? Oh, for me, it's always sweet and creamy. <laughs> I love sweet and creamy. Other people like crunchy, right? The, yeah, I got some head shakes going there, head nods there. For me, the texture of joy is rough. I love rough towels. I love that scratchy. Oh, you want to scratch my back? Oh, that makes me so happy. I love a Korean spa, those salt scrubs, that rough texture, my feet in the sand. I love that experience. Some people like soft and velvety and smooth, right? Maybe that's your texture. Know it for you. What is joy for you? The smell of it feeling of it. And I want you to put all those things together and I want you to put that in your heart. I want you to teach your heart this joy. I want you to put that color in your heart. I want you to put that texture in your heart. I want you to feel that vibration, that frequency in your heart. I want you to wrap your heart in it. Fill it up. When your heart is full then I want you to nod your head and I want you to share it with every other part of your being. Feel it rushing through your pulse, your veins, your arteries. Understand it as it flows through your body. Share it with every fiber, with every tissue of your being deep down into your bones. Bring that experience of joy. 
Let it go into the crevices of your mind wherever there was that anxiety or fear or that obsessive hijacking thought. Bring that joy. Offer it like a gift and say, I love you. I'm so sorry you're suffering. I love myself so much that I consciously create this joy. I consciously bring it into the world. I consciously walk it into my life. And I want you to see yourself now walking in your body, feeling it in your bones. I want you to know it in your feet as they touch the ground, in your shoulders as you move. I want you to think about if you speak, when you speak, that color is coming out of your mouth, that beautiful blue, that amazing glowing yellow sun is shining in your words. Bring it into life. Physically take it. We do not create from matter. You don't create from something that exists. You create from potential, from possibility. You create from moments like this. You create from this conscious awareness of saying, I am stepping out into myself. I am understanding myself, and I am walking it forward into life. That is true visioning. That is true conscious creation. Step it forward. Bring it into form. You create from the quantum field, from what I like to call is zero potential the place of zero, where there is absolute potential and possibility. The place that the universe was created from nothing came everything. Stepping out of your past, stepping out of yourself, stepping out of your pain, stepping out of your fear, judgment, or worry, stepping out of the skin color, stepping out of your gender orientation, stepping out of your sex, stepping out of everything, and creating from pure source to say yes, and to call it forward into form, to call it forward as you, walking it into life right now. <sighs> and so this is a little graphic from my book. This is Billy. And Billy, Billy's afraid to jump off a diving board. Ernest Holmes said, when prayer removes distrust and doubt and enters the field of mental certainty, it becomes faith, and the universe is built on faith. What you just did is this. You stepped out. You went deep within. You created an experience of joy, mental certainty, and you bring that forward now into life. You walk it into being. It is what the universe is built upon. Do you understand? And so I'm going to wrap up just with a little last quote. And that's Billy celebrating with his monster. <laughs> life isn't about waiting for the storm to pass. It's about learning to dance in the rain. It's not about fighting what is. It's about loving. Thank you for loving. Thank you for opening your heart. Thank you for connecting with me today. Thank you for filling my heart and touching my heart, the energy that you put forward in this room. I'm inviting you to walk it into the rest of your life. Namaste. Well, that was beautiful, beautiful. Thank you so much. So we're going to go into a very abbreviated table conversations today. <laughs> I'm going to give you about five minutes. <laughs> so you'll just get a a glimpse of uh, chatting through any of these questions that um, your heart wants to talk about. And then we will um, go from there. So I'm giving you about five minutes.
moment, connecting with the truth that we are all one. Father, Mother, God, creator of all things, divine consciousness. I play in that consciousness right now. I claim this goodness, I claim this peace, I claim this experience of love and joy for each and every one of us, knowing it in all the parts of me, knowing it using all the parts of me. My joy fills this body as I let it overflow into life. As I declare this joy to be my joy, I can claim it for you. And so in that understanding and in that love, I know that that joy is flowing powerfully through this room, through this space, and out into the world in everything we do and everything we say as our feet walk it into life, as our voice speak it into being. I know that God's joy is my joy. And in that understanding, I release these words with thanksgiving. I am so grateful that I can allow myself to lean into the goodness of God. And in that knowing, I say, and so it is. Ah, yeah. So it is. Mm -hmm.